water as well as land. Though there are no leaves to fall, the waves that were a bright hard blue yesterday under a fading sky today are green, opaque and cold. If you're a boy not wanted in the house, you walk the beach for hours, feeling the winter that has come in the night. With a few short sentences, Jean Wolf set the stage, the atmosphere and the relationships the boy has in his short story, The Island of Dr. Death and Other Stories. A very warm welcome to all our listeners. Uh, we apologize for our uh, absence last week as some of us were taken sick. But come with us this week as we take a trip to the island of Dr. Death. With me today are Nikita Zuev and Robert Gibson. Told in the second person perspective, the Island of Dr. Death and Other Stories is nominated for the Nebula Award for Best Short Story and published later in 1980 under a collection titled The Island of Dr. Death and Other Stories and Other Stories. That is the actual title. So this, this collection features other stories all with Death, Doctor and Island in their titles. Although, as far as I can tell, they are not connected. But... If our readers and listeners know better, please feel free to uh, educate us and put it down in the comment section below. So the lonely boy walking along the beach is Techman Babcock. He lives with his divorced mother who is preparing to host a costume party. The story starts with his mother's boyfriend picking him up from the beach with a gift. A book with a picture of a man in rags fighting a creature that is part human and part ape. As the story progresses, the walls of Techman's reality begins to blur. Characters from the book appeared before Techman, talking and interacting with him. Interwoven within this fevered narratives, narrative are glimpses into Techman's life and those of the adults around him. The characters in the book become more and more real to Techman and Dr. Death, the villain of the book, showed Techman what Dr. Black the man his mother might marry had been injecting her with something, very much like Dr. Death himself had done to his experimental subjects. Techman rushes to get help, and the police come. The story closes with a last deeper glimpse into Techman's life as Dr. Death appeared beside him once more, reassuring Techman that although the story will end soon, it can begin again if he would only flip the pages of the book back to the beginning and start all over. Well, before I pass the feather to my co-host for their opinion, I will mention that this onion of a story is in part a tribute to The Island of Dr. Mor Moru by History Wells, and a well-crafted story within a story that is more than worthwhile to check out. All right. Any one of you want to take the baton? Mm. Oh, you're muted. I, I was muted. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Well, Gibson, uh, please. Yeah, I'll just say that my first emotional reaction to this story was that it's just a bit too clever for me. Um, but I respect the skill that's gone into gone into it so any criticism i might make of the tale is more like a criticism of my ability to read rather than gene wolf's ability to write after all i get on well with his book of the new sun tetralogy so it's nothing wrong with his status as a writer in my book anyway um I can see that it's a story strongly hinting or suggesting that with sufficiently vivid imagination, you find the characters in the books you read come alive. And in this case, they literally come alive, a bit like the villain in Stephen King's The Dark Half. But... Uh, you can argue it's not doesn't need to be considered as definite as the dark half. It's uh, something that you can 
argue either way, although the way the viewpoint changes during the story does rather suggest that we're dealing with real phenomena, not just uh, imagination. And uh, all in all, it's a puzzle. And if you like puzzles, you'll like this story. I'm not that fond of puzzles, but that's that's my fault. Nikki. So, oh, is that your last word? Do you have anything else you want to say, Robert? Um, I would say that uh, I'll probably read it again sometime, which is quite a compliment because there are loads of stories which I, I'm determined never to read again. Fair enough. Like the snows of Kilimanjaro. <laughs> quite, um, quite. In fact, I'm determined hello, to read that the first time either. Yeah. <laughs> dear, dear viewers, dear listeners, um, I want to apologize for my voice. I am currently um, ill, as you can hear. Uh, so for that, I'm sorry, but, you know, we decided that uh, entertainment must be brought to the masses. And so... Um, oh, my idea of a gladiatorial battle between XJ and Robert was rejected, so now we have to have this podcast instead. Right. Um, the the uh, island of uh, Doctor Death and other stories. Um, you know the short story, not the book titled exactly the same way. Uh, well, it's not titled exactly the same way. It's called the Island of Doctor Death and other stories and, and other stories. Other stories. You know? Correct. Yeah. Uh, Gene Wolf, you think you're very funny, don't you? All right. Um, so, so, I mean, <clears throat> this is probably the only story. Uh, may, may I, I, I have to correct myself. The only English uh, story that I've ever read that was in second perspective at times where it speaks to you uh you know saying like you you know you're wandering through your mother's house and blah 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 uh, and at first that that was very strange to me and then i understood why this device was used and if there's any way a or any reason one would use second perspective uh which is in itself a very strange way of writing it's in a story like this, and it's done fantastically, um, in my opinion. The this idea of placing you into the narrative of the pulp magazine slash book that our protagonist, that us, that we are reading, um, and creating the juxtaposition to know when we are in the quote unquote real world and when we are in the you know part of the story. It's done so beautifully, and it blends it so well together. And it also applies this innocence to our character that almost immediately gets crushed in the first three um, uh, pages, where uh, as you know, this 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 kid, this teenager, is picking something up, some drugs from the drugstore uh, with you. He he ha he makes a sly comment about your mother. Uh, that's like icky and gross and weird. But you don't get it as a kid, right? And and the narrative in that second perspective does it so well. You can really feel the how uncomfortable you are, but you don't really know why because you're a child. You don't. It doesn't really get to explain to you why you should feel weird about it. But yet you do because you are in the perspective of uh, the protagonist. Um, and from that moment on, I realized we had something very special picked up for, for today's uh, podcast. Because the story um, is about escapism. The story is about what it means to create, what it means to live with your creations, what it's like to lose them, and what it's like to be reminded that everything that you make is just an echo of the real world. And that real world can be very scary and hurtful and disgusting in many ways. And when the kid gets yanked out of his fantasy, 
you know, at the end, and he is spoken to by the police, uh, where they're trying to find out more information regarding this drug bust that they just did. You know, it's 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 really something, especially where you you think like every other story would make it so that like oh yeah well. We we need to have some sort of good guys here, so the cops are going to be nice and gentle with the kid and whatever. And they are, but you can clearly see the underlying, you know, like, them trying to weed out as much information from the child as possible. You're like, oh, no, we're just helping you out. Don't worry about it. You know, like, uh, basically incriminate your own mother for us, you know. And you're like, wow, man. And, you, and then that was all packed in a short story. Um that was written from two perspectives, that was juggling all those juxtapositions. I mean, it's fantastic. You, you really have to tip your hat to Gene Wolfe uh, for creating something like this um, and for making it work on uh, this little time and this little amount of development for everything. And yet, I don't think you need to be um, a literary genius to see why all those elements when they've com been combined like this and that they all work this well together, why well, that's an achievement. Um, truly, I think this is uh, one of the best written short stories that we've had on the podcast um, from an author who, who always writes dark things, but even this, I mean, I think this is the darkest of, of, of stories by Gene Wolfe that I've ever read because of the subject matter and how teeth-shatteringly horrible that revelation of a spoiled youth comes to you, you know, throughout the story. You can see the train about to crash. There's nothing you can do and you just continue. It, it's given me the same anxious feelings that I had when we uh, read Lost Hearts, just like worse. Way worse, because we were the kid in the story, and the subject matter was way more real than it was in Lost Hearts. Lost Hearts still feels like a, like a story you would tell at a campsite, even though it's, you know, there are moments of it being so lucid and so real that, you know, that's, that's why it sends shivers down my spine, because the, you know, the children are in danger and there's literally no say, uh, you know, sane adult there to, to help them. But here... It's, it's, it's like so realistic, so creepy because of it. And nothing really bad happens to the kid, but you can just see that their life is heading in the wrong way. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Well, I can't say I really enjoyed it. I, I was amazed by the craftsmanship of the story. To say that I enjoyed it would, would, I think, miss the point of the tale. The tale wasn't there to be enjoyed, it was there to showcase something to give to you an emotion and i feel i feel like it uh, it reached me it reached me this this short tale there you go that those are my thoughts so far that is a very very uh um well put together take nikki thank you yeah maybe i should be ill more often <laughs> uh do you think that's possible? <laughs> <laughs> Any, for your money, actually, anything is possible. Uh, well, uh, I have to say this is a very... Uh, so, like both Rob and Nikki, I think this is an exceptionally well put together story. Um, it's also very sobering. Uh, I agree with Nikki. It's... Um, there are there are so many layers to this story and I'm I'm not certain I can do justice to it to be quite honest. It it would take me several readings to to really uh get in full what Jin Wolf is trying to achieve here. But uh I will say so first of all, um it is a story within a story. And Part of the it's very interesting how so first of all uh, the book that 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 
our young protagonist tech man picked up from the pharmacy that is very clearly the island of dr death itself so so we are we right from the start jean wolf tells us you know you're about to go on a trip and uh and uh, i think the the brilliance of what he did here in this story is you know in if the story was about anything else other than a troubled childhood with a mother that is uh, pretty much a drug addict um it would have probably been more removed harder to get into harder to understand but the 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 situation the circumstances of the uh, boy himself is something that uh, that is very very um re- real is a very real thing like we we do know people who come from broken homes and this is one of them and and the i would say that the thing that blew me away the most about this story is how those clues about Techman's um situation comes so subtly like Jin Wolf didn't really spend too much time belaboring all the points about how terrible uh Techman's uh, situation is he he just describes the stuff and then uh let you put let the reader put things together for himself and you know towards the end I'm like wondering like like some of some and some of the things are not like none of the none of the situation is explicitly um described and one of the things that i wonder is if the mother did not spike uh did not feed drugs to techman uh himself because um Techman's hallucination seems very very real. And the whole thing just reminds me of a person taking, you know, LSD or something like that. And I I wonder if uh if uh the mother hadn't been uh giving Techman things mm. along the side, you know. And and it's very disturbing because And I really like the last scene because Dr. Death showed Dr. Black doing things to the mother and from the boy's perspective it is a terrible terrible thing that he was trying to do but then the uh police later came and said no actually Dr. Black is doing something good for your mom. Right because um apparent according to the police but we don't know for sure because not nothing is really uh described according to the police the Dr Black was injecting the mother with uh with um uh with something to uh I'm not sure what kind of drugs you 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 would inject a person with but if uh if you overdose on something uh maybe the doctor will um uh put some kind of a uh, will inject you with some antidote. some antidote yeah something like that not quite sure what but you know like uh, man like i'm just stumbling over my words here uh just trying to find uh ways to express just how brilliant this uh short story really is but yeah i'm failing i think i think the best way to really showcase to somebody how great the island of Dr. Death is, uh, and other stories is is by just telling them go read it because i really don't think that the, anybody could advertise it better than the story itself it's one of those i mean we spoiled it for this podcast as you as you've all heard but it really doesn't matter honestly like you you could have read the summary of this and you would be like ah well you know i get it it's it's such a it's such a basic story right like kids got a mother the mother's an addict uh, he's trying to escape in a book or in some sort of a media you know like tales all this time it's not about the story it's about the way it's done and it's done brilliantly 
by the author by mixing the second and the third perspective of uh, you know in uh, creating this story that spans both the tale of whatever's happening in those pulp um magazines or pulp book i guess um and and also how that coincides with the kids real life i have to say by the way i would i would read the pulp magazine slash book that our protagonist is reading like for real i, I wish there was like you know like an added edited extras by gene wolf that was actually just a full story of what the, what the hell is happening with Captain Ransom and Dr. Jack. I cared about that way more than I did uh, about the kid uh, for almost like three-fourths of the book, uh, book, of the short story, until it got to the end and it hit me really hard. Hmm. I was like, why are we back with Dr. Whoever Black and all these people? Like, I don't care. Can we go back to the book where there's like an Amazonian lost race and a dogman monster and Captain Ramson is about to fight Dr. De like, that's what I want to see, you know? Maybe I, I am that kid. Mm. Hmm. Yeah. But the, the parallels with the island of Dr. Morrow are very, very strong. Um, that's perhaps just one thing you haven't mentioned yet all that much, Nikki. But uh, apart from that, I think you uh, have rather put me to shame in your analysis of the story. I think you've done it much better justice than I have. I'll tell you one thing, just to try and get over something that I'm not too happy about in the story, it's it's a very mm. minor point. It's just that I sometimes get the feeling that a particular author is sort of elbowing me and saying, you know, look how subtle I am. And <laughs> there's a bit right at the beginning where the island is defined not really. It's you're, sh you're shown that it actually isn't really an island. It's more like a peninsula. And mm -hmm. that's sort of like the author elbowing me and saying look you see nothing is is like what it seems but you know it's mm. fair enough it's it's fair enough it's a very a very minor petty little point to to make and also i agree thoroughly with the fact that it's a good enough story to be immune to spoilers as as nikki says it's the way it's done it's not the i'm gonna be honest when i was writing the uh, summary summary i was in a conundrum i was like how do i describe this without spoiling the thing <laughs> mm. and it, it doesn't matter yeah i mean <clears throat> you have to uh, for me right the way the way i read it i didn't feel the condensation but i can definitely understand why someone would feel the way you did robert right and that's Fully, I fully get that. I was reading it like I was opening a travel guide. I was very fascinated by it because it was just like, yeah, so there's this peninsula and this is what happens. And I'm like, oh, wow. I The beginning of this tale really fooled me. I thought that this was going to be like a really um, 1940s, 1930s style story where somebody arrives on an island and it turns out to be this Dr. Deaf guy who's, uh, you know, a strange fella. And there's going to be an investigation, you know, based on that beginning. Because it re really much felt to me like someone beginning a tale um, in an old-fashioned way where they start by really explaining where this is taking place to get the, uh, the character, um, you know, situated in your head. Like, okay, this is where they're going. And, uh, you know, so that you feel more in their shoes. But, you know, I feel like that, that whole beginning is kind of a bamboozlement almost. You know, mm -hmm. it, it sort of puts you into this very different mindset. And then the, the thing that took me out of it was when very uncharacteristically for those, um, um, for those stories, the, uh, the guy that got him the book, uh, the, the teenager that also got the drugs, right? Um, when he said that, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he said something twisted and nasty, like, and sexual about that kid's mother. And that's, that moment of shock 
right? This is why I will always defend some profanity in stories. When something like that comes out of nowhere, out of the left field, or comes in a moment where it's really needed, it's a fantastic tool. Anything can be used as a, as a beautiful tool. I mean, look at morphine, right? Morphine has saved millions of lives. Morphine has also killed millions of people. It's not the tool, it's how you use it, right? Um, so, so here we've got this, this really nasty language uh, regarding, regarding the woman, you know, like, ah, oh, she tasted sweet or something like that. I can't remember exactly. But it's just, it's, it's icky, it's, it's not nice. Um, and if it was, if it was more like, uh, Robert prefers it where, uh, they would say like, and then, you, and then you hear some weird and nasty comment about your mother and you wonder what's all that that's all about, but then you move on. It's like, it, it that over explains it. it. Just hearing that off comment and kind of not reacting to it as the second POV is what makes that moment so uh, punchy, right? By, by just not expecting it. And being hit with it, uh, that's what makes it so, uh, so brilliant. So I, you know, um, I guess maybe, maybe I'm forming a difference of opinion here with Robert. Mm. I think okay. a good example of how unexpectedly you can do without profanity is um, okay. the orcs in the Lord of the Rings. You'd think if anyone was going to swear, it would be the orcs. But actually, the worst they ever say is gone. Um, they don't do anything worse than that, but they're still pretty horrible. I think, all right. If if you are in this, this is a this is a scene right that I imagine in my head when I want to make this argument. Like, let's say you you um are you have been taken to the dinner of a very aristocratic family. Right, and they're all have being nice to you and so on and so forth. And you're there as a businessman, as a merchant, as an outsider, and so on and so forth. And then you, you know, like that character, they push their luck just a little bit too hard. And then you know, the nice granny that that's been st sitting the entire, she's the matriarch of the of the family. You know, like, and then it's like, you know, everyone's laughing, and but they've noticed that the you know the the merchant has still put over the line, and she just like gently takes her hand and puts it. Uh, on his and then whispers something to him and you expect some sort of a snarky remark you know like oh you know like you if Dan did it now you have to be very silent at this moment if you have that woman say something along the lines of like you're going to be eating shit tonight if you don't shut up you know like it's really going to shock the um, uh, the reader and the character right and the reader and the character are both going to share that moment and they're going to create a bond between, uh, you know, the tale that they're reading, the experience, and their enjoyment, right? Um, so, of course, shock value and, and, and shock um, entertainment is the cheapest form of entertainment. I'm not saying it's not, by any means necessary. But just because something is cheap doesn't mean that you can't sparingly use it in order to underline something very strong. I yeah. think I think for that particular scene in the Island of Dr. Death and other stories, though, uh, Gene Wolfe was trying to do something different with the with the very uh, nasty and explicit uh, comment that he made to the kid. Because you have to wonder what kind of a guy... Uh, what's his name? Jack? Maybe Jack. I, I can't remember I can't any of his names. This, this fella... You have to wonder what kind of fellow he is to say that to a boy about his mother. You know, in just disregarding what he's doing with the mother in the first place. Mm. Because, because, I mean, what, what, are the, what are the common circumstances you, you, uh, a, a, a man would have a relationship with a woman with who already has a child? Like it could be, it could be just a, a very casual thing, or it could be, you know, uh, because he 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 wants to uh, ha ha take her family as his, or it could be something really more nasty and sinister. And and the I think the 
way the man made the comment to the kid shows just how just how uh is it really sick though because i don't know because maybe the guy is feeling some re some sort of resentment uh towards the boy or something that i mean it, it hints at a lot of troubled uh, relationship underneath and I think in that particular situation, um, the way, the way uh, Jack, or whatever his name is, said what he said to Techman, that is, that sh really that really shows something. That brings that puts a much stronger punctuation to 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 uh, uh, hint at the kind of a, a relationship between Jack. Techman and his mom. So there's a lot more than just profanity going on there, which I will agree with. Yeah, of course, know. but that's that's what I'm saying, right? Yeah. That this the the profanity is what helps all of that to come out. Yeah. Um. It's not about the tool; it's how you use it. Yeah. Brilliant story, really. I I don't mm. know. Feel unqualified to to tackle this story to be quite honest <laughs> i feel like drax basically everything flew over me. you my feel head. like drax <laughs> well apparently i've I've researched this there's apparently the the story is part of a trilogy oh, there's yeah? also the death of dr island um and the uh, the doctor of death island so here's the thing i've read the doctor of death island and i cannot see anything connected to the island of dr death and other stories which is why I I'm not I'm not exactly sure how uh they're a trilogy. Yeah. Well, you know, unless you want to commit a horrible deed and unearth Gene Wolf and then perform experiments <laughs> upon his body. Make a seance. Uh, I don't think we'll maybe, ever know. Maybe that's what we should do from now on. We should call summon forth the spirits of uh Robert E. Howard. This, this sounds like to me a <laughs> Me? Yeah. Well, Robert E. Howard. I mean, I if it was a plot in one of my D and D campaigns, I definitely think I would enjoy it. But performing it on 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 people with real families, I I might feel a a teeny bit of a bit of uh, resentment for myself, but just tiny one. Um, the story actually reminds me of um of something that every artist wants to do, um, but. You know, a lot of the times when they do try it, it kind of comes flat. And that is this artistic idea of of self and, and um, you know, what it means, right? Because that what the story does is uh, it explores what it means to be a reader and why people read and what benefit reading brings to you, right? What kind of things it can give you. And that whole uh, bit at the end with Dr. Death saying, like, look, we can all be alive again. We can all have the, you know, our day in the, in the sun. You just got to start from page one. Okay, right? That, that creeped me out, to be honest. Like, major. Yeah? It really creeped me out. It was like, oh, <laughs> oh <my> God. <laughs> what are you trying to say here, Mr. Wolf? <laughs> So you took it as like a like a nineteen seventies Japanese horror movie was like it's never over. <laughs> like, no, it's this, more this like so. Look, okay, because of the context, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the drug abuse the the mother is going through, and by that time I was already sus suspecting that the mother is feeding the boy Techman with drugs. I was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mr. Wolf, are you saying all the to Techman that all this can be better? All he has to do is take the drugs again. <laughs> oh, that's the way. That was were, how yeah. I read it. I was like, I was majorly uh. creeped out by <laughs> the end of that. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> okay, well, I'm I'm usually the the conspiracy theorist on the podcast. It's nice. It's nice to be on the other side for a change. I do like it. I do like it. It's an, it's interesting. Um, I have to say, uh, to 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 finish my point. Yeah, it, so this whole artistic idea of implementing your 
your readership into a story or into the work that you're doing is seldom done this well, right? But everybody wants to do it. I, I remember at least in the 90s, uh, the early 2000s, that was the huge fad. Everybody wanted to do that whole thing. Like, we're talking directly to you, the viewer. It's all, you know, like, this is not just uh, a blockbuster. This is about something. This is about, a, uh, you know, like an issue. This is about a thing that we have to take a stand on and so on and so forth. But here it's done so brilliantly that it puts all those attempts to shame. And it just, uh, you know, that, that it, it brings me to wonder what exactly is so well done in this story that, you know, m so many others fail uh, at. And the conclusion that I've come to is um, a very simple one is it's not trying to shock you. Uh, it's literally just giving you the perspective of what it would be like to be a child in that situation. And it does so by limiting the vocabulary and the sense and structure of the second point of view, which, which is already a very limited way to write second point of view. That's why many people don't do it, right? Um, and then being so elaborate during the island of Dr. Death um, se uh, sequences, right? To me, that, mm, how shall we say, that clash in the story, because it's done so well, it really breathes life into this idea of, um, you know, breaking down the wall between you, the reader, and the story. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, but perhaps you guys have a, a different op of a opinion as to why the um, you know the blending of realities works so well in the story. No, I think uh, I agree with you. This mm. is this is one of the very rare stories I've read where the fourth wall was completely and very ably broken. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's not, you know, it seems to me it's very hard to talk about a story that we all really enjoyed. And, like, you know, I think the best thing that we could really do on this podcast, dear viewers, is just say, go read it. I don't yes. know, um, you know, like, discussing it we can do as much as possible. We can, you know, like, analyze every single character. But to be honest, the, the story does that all for you if you read it, right? And there's going to be so many questions you're going to have on your head. I, I in your don't head. know. I don't know. Um, I don't know if I would say I enjoyed reading the story, just like Nikki. It's, uh, mm. but it is. It is. It. You. Any read any lover of the written word, or the English language, will do themselves themselves a disservice if they don't <laughs> read this short story it is just mm. brilliant mm. whether you like it or not is a separate story obviously but man it's it's definitely something to check out mm. it's uh it's written by somebody who has enormous skill with words uh that's all one can say it's uh it's like the book of the new sun is you may have different views on that but it, by golly it's it's well written yeah well i i don't know how much more praise i can heap on this uh short story to be quite honest mm. do we have anything else we want to say <laughs> Um, Gene Wolfe, if you're out there, uh, write the actual short story of uh, The Island of Dr. Death. Uh, I feel that's, like you've cheated that's out. Actually, that's actually a good point. Let's talk about the story within the story itself. Uh, there, it, like, like Rob has mentioned, it's, uh, it's actually very, it has a lot of parallels with The, Doctor of, uh, uh, the Island of Dr. Maru by H.G. Wells. Um, yeah. I think Ransom himself is a homage to some other character. I can't quite recall offhand. I don't know, but he's awesome. I love Captain. Yeah, he's, he's he's my favorite character. He's uh he's 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 a he's a he's a Conan type of hero, man. As, except he's a sailor. 
not a <laughs> not a barbarian. Yeah. Well, the island of I, I just North yeah is, uh, is is a sort of anti-god book, isn't it? Although, unlike most anti-god books, it's not saying God doesn't exist. It's saying he does exist, but he's uh, a cruel experimenter because Doctor Morrow is a a symbol of a malignant creator. Yeah. Yeah, something a um, it stuck with me a lot. So uh, an atheist I knew once said to me, uh, he said like, I choose not to believe that God doesn't exist because if he does, then we're really f uh, fucked. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, he believed that um, uh, God is this like cruel uh, creature that enjoys the pain of others. And I suppose, I guess, Dr. Death, uh, because he's an homage to Dr. Maru, he's kind of very similar to that, right? He's taken over this island that the ancient people used to have all to themselves and you know he's doing these horrible experiments upon uh people and um and animals and you know putting them together i mean you could also actually take it as um anti-nature <laughs> story right the the island of dr Monroe, because that's what kind of you know what nature does it combines the best traits of a of a single species and um the the ones that survive are the ones with those traits so you know I mean, natural selection actually going back to the story outside of that uh outside of the island story um it just occurred to me that probably the little boy uh much um uh the little boy his favorite character is probably dr death because Ransom never talked yeah. to him. And then he's clearly very sympathetic to uh, Dr. Death uh, to the point where he's hallucinating uh, uh, Dr. Death telling the boy, look, it's all an act. Ransom, Ransom, Ransom and I, we just put the show. At the end of the day, we go back. You know, wow. I, I just, now I'm just like starting to wonder just how... Uh, <laughs> Twisted uh, Techman actually is. <laughs> I mean, look, if you told me, right, you either get to be a super scientist who is, who, who is so advanced in his, um, you know, ways that he's able to cross create, uh, you know, human hybrids with animals. I mean, think about like what other things that that guy is capable of. Or you get to be a shirtless Captain Ransom. Uh, the hero. I mean, like, you know, I'm tempted to be uh, shirtless and pretty, but I'm definitely, uh, like, soberly uh, choosing to be Dr. Death. I mean, could change the world with that kind of knowledge. Could be. Could be. Well, mm -hmm. I've always felt that uh, villains are more interesting than heroes to write at any rate. Well, you know why? Because you have to justify why the villain is doing what he's doing. You don't really have to justify why the good guy is good. You know, it's like the basic template. He, one of his family members died, so now he sees that death, sees how horrible the world is, and he wants to undo that in the world. Whoa! Holy moly, what a motivation, right? Like, but that, it works. But with a, with a villain, you gotta be like, and then his father tried to feed him to hyenas, but he survived. And you're like, yes, he did survive. Those damn hyenas get wrecked. You know, and so on and so forth. Get wrecked is get destroyed. I'm, I'm sorry, Robert. I'm, I'm using the, the, the modern language in a, in a terrible way. Um, well, for, yeah. me, for, so, me, for me, it's more like uh, you, can take, uh, you can take a villain in all sorts of different directions. But heroes really only come from one mode. Mm. So they, 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 they're very square. They do tend to become boring. And when they try to... Uh, when people try to give a bit more dimension to heroes, they end up being uh, more often than not edgy. You know, edge lord. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's it's very hard to write a morally good person, interestingly. Yeah. Right? Um, I guess you would have to do that in a way where it's a constant struggle for them to keep being this pious. Right? So, I've read the Dan Abnett. Uh, we, we've had him on 
our podcast a couple of times, uh, his book, uh, his short stories. I've read uh, a couple of the <clears throat> of the books uh, uh, regarding uh, the um, the Gaunt's ghosts, right? Like we, we read the short story, the very first one called Ghostmaker, which is about the formation of the regiment of that of the Imperial Guard, right? Mm -hmm. Gaunt being the the father, so to speak, and he's like, so his his whole character is commissar with a golden heart right like he he knows that uh, disciplining people all the time is not going to get you anywhere but there are a few moments in, in in that book series where he just has to like to like he does commit like horrible atrocities to basically be like look this is what happens when you don't obey my orders right like he like executes people and stuff like that and when it does happen you're like oh damn gaunt and that's what makes him so interesting is because like he realizes that he's a part of this uh, horrible machine the imperial guard that treats everyone's lives as if they were nothing because there's literally not billions not trillions but quadrillions of human souls and they're just you know, they're used as resources in these endless wars that the uh, Warhammer universe has. Um, and yeah, it's, and it's those brief moments where he has to obey the system or he has to use the system in this horrible way, which everybody else around him does it, right? So you're kind of like, ah, man, we're kind of going to give you a pass here. Like, y you've done so much good that you... And, and But he doesn't think that way. Like, he has horrible nightmares about it. He drinks... He starts uh, acting erratically after he has to do these uh, horrible things. So I think maybe that's one way that you could write a goody two-shoes. Occasionally give them something bad to do. <laughs> um, oh, oh, by the way, I'm going to say to both of you, um, I'm, I'm taking this hyena idea with the father, trying to, trying to feed this, you know, <laughs> the son. To the, this is going to be one of my uh, villain origins, so... Okay. Yeah, don't you steal it. <laughs> All right. No, don't worry. I won't. I won't steal the uh, origin story of Hyena Men. Amazing. Amazing. Amazing name. What were you going to say, Robert? I was saying that, of course, it is a big challenge to write about good characters, but I think it can be done if you go about it in such a way that you're writing, for example, about the issues involved in taking risks, because due to the pressures of life sometimes you have to take big risks or at least if you're a, a character you do mm -hmm. a fictional character and those risks can involve great spiritual dangers but it doesn't mean that the character isn't good to undertake those risks it just means that um, you have to be very canny and very uh, perhaps very intelligent in order to survive and that's what makes the character interesting of course it's hard to write that because you've got to be canny yourself but then you know that's that's one of the disadvantages of, of the trade of writer you've got to try and think of something something impressive one of my favorite tropes for goody two shoes uh, kind of characters when uh, you as the reader uh, and the and the antagonist both are of one mind that what the what the character about to do is insanely stupid uh, right and the goody two shoes has like an ace up his sleeve and they ba it basically boils down to, you know, like the villain being like, wow, you really are letting me win. Like, you know, the virus is 99%, uh, you know, downloaded. Why you keep trying to, um, you know, like put me uh, on your side? This is ridiculous. You are being ridiculous. I've won. Why would I join you? And the, the hero is like, oh, yeah, I'm doing this because I'm giving you one last chance to, you know, like t to not do this. Right. Like. And he's like, what? I won. Shut up. And he's like, no, no, I've, I've won like 20 minutes ago. And you've been, you know, moving your gums for the last 20 minutes, uh, thinking that you did win. And you've just proven to me that, yeah, there's no, 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 there's no saving you. And then the goody two shoes kills the, the villain so that it doesn't happen. You know, that, I think that's, that's the most badass way you could end any, any sort of uh, story with a really bad guy and a really good guy. Hmm.
Mm. All right. Uh, we are we are in the, we're not in the realm of a tangent. We're in the realm of a different discussion at this point. Yeah. I well, I think so. Uh, I think we have probably just exhausted uh, what we have to say about the uh, island of Doctor Death and other stories. So we come yep. to the final part of our ritual, I suppose, and uh, it's time to give a score. Gentlemen, take it away. I don't know how this story could be improved, so it's a 10 out of 10 based on that technicality. Um, I wouldn't say that it is like something that I enjoyed reading, as I said before, right? So, but not giving it a 10 out of 10 would be disingenuous. So it's a 10 out of 10. It's a 10 out of 10 with an asterisk of like, I, I might read it in five years and, and just be like, yeah, this is still depressing. Cool. You know. Hmm. Rob? Well, I'll, uh, I'll, I decided some time ago I was going to give it 8.5 out of 10. Mm. And although I, I understand uh, Nikki's logic about giving it a 10, uh, there's some stubborn ingredient in my mind which persists in giving it 8.5, whether it's justified or not. So that's what I'll do, 8.5 due to this inertia in my in my mind <laughs> hmm I will give it a 9 it is a very well written story hmm. alright I guess that's it yes. uh, go read the short story to all our listeners once again read it and uh, if you have uh anything to tell us at all about the island of Dr. Death and other stories, the Doctor of Death Island, and then the other one, please put it down in the comment section below. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you very much for listening. Have a nice day. Take care.